This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking today with Mark Stein of SteinOnline.com, regular guest host for Rush Limbaugh, and the author of a pair of best-selling books on apocalyptic doom both home and abroad, America Alone and After America. In addition to doom on the macro level, as the Washington Post has dubbed him, Mark is also the world's wittiest obit writer, as exemplified by his book Mark Stein's Passing Parade, newly updated and available on Dead Tree format, appropriately enough, and finally for the Kindle as well. And Mark, thanks for stopping by today. My, my pleasure, Ed. We only, we only put it on Kindle for you. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope more people than just myself have bought a copy. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't know how that works. I think uh, normally with these things, it uh, you, you have to have inventory and a, and a warehouse. But I think we printed up thirty thousand Kindle editions, and then you bought one of them, so we've got twenty nine thousand Kindle <laughs> sitting sitting in the warehouse somewhere. Mark, as I've mentioned in several blog posts, I love the original edition of the Passing Parade, and I've given it as a gift to friends. I think it's a brilliant snapshot of popular and political culture at the start of the 21st century. But how did you get into the obit business in the first place? Well, I think the very first obituaries I I wrote were for um, The Independent in London, which uh, I helped start. And uh, they, they had a very, they had a very uh, colorful obituaries page. They, they actually had personality obituaries, which they don't really have in the United States in the same way. And I, I tended to get the ones that nobody else was interested in. So I, I would get like obscure Broadway figures who introduced the Pink Lady Waltz in uh, 1915 and that kind of thing, uh, which basically just because there was uh, nobody uh, around in the building who'd ever heard of them. So I, that, that was how I started doing them. And I think there's actually one of those, there's a couple of those from that era in the book, Stuart Hamblin. Um, the guy who wrote This Old House, which was a big hit for Rosemary Clooney, uh, and is, I believe, the only number one song ever written in the presence of a dead body, because uh, Stuart Hamblin was a, basically an old cowboy actor who was up in the hills and uh, came uh, to an abandoned cabin uh, and found a dead, dead prospector in there. And, uh, and instead of like calling 911 and uh, on his cell phone and having them take him away, as we would now, he, uh, he got out a piece of paper and wrote the song This Old House. And he was the Prohibition Party candidate in 1952. Um, I don't <laughs> believe he won, if memory serves. Uh, but but, but he, he's an example of just someone who's like a peripheral uh, fringe figure uh, but who kind of wanders in, uh, you know, fairly big subjects of American politics and religion and pop music. Uh, so he's, he's worth writing about just because he's at the intersection of all that kind of stuff. Mark, is it a coincidence that Wayne Newton's Donka Shane plays a role in your obits for two very different but very self-destructive pop culture figures with a death wish, Evil Knievel and Tupac Shakur? Yeah, no, I well, I I think I think I wrote about Tupac first, uh, just because uh, I have a lot of respect for Wayne Newton. By the way, I I was driving uh, about three weeks after the fall of Saddam Hussein, uh, and I was driving through the western desert of Iraq, through all those towns that uh, shortly afterwards uh, came to be regarded as the hotbed of the Sunni Triangle, Ramadi and Fallujah. And uh, I think Rootba is the is the westernmost town, and and I remember going into Rootba and having uh, and uh, I went into a cafe and I said to the guy, "What's what's what's on the menu?" And he recommended the mixed grill, uh, which was entirely unmixed because it was just like th- this this chicken that had been slaughtered in 1973. I would guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you know, and then uh, you know, and, and then a glass of water with the uh, w- with the uh, cocktail umbrella with the coliform bacteria in the top. Uh, and I was I was thinking I was thinking you know I, and I'm, I'm not trying to say anything about the Iraqi people who are actually utterly delightful and charming to me, but there's a sort of fatalism there. And I, I remember just thinking, as I was driving through the desert, at one point I couldn't get anything on the radio, and I actually just wound up singing uh, Wayne Newton and Dan Cachet, because I was thinking what this, <laughs> what this western desert of Iraq really needs is actually its own version of Vegas and Wayne Newton and full supporting orchestra. 
uh, singing Dangashe at the uh, at the Caesar's Palace of uh, of Ramadi or Fallujah. And of course, it didn't get that. Instead, it got the Sunni Triangle uh, insurrection and uh, and a lot of violence. But I so I I have a a, a huge respect for Wayne Newton. And when I came to write about Tupac Shakur, uh, the slain gangster rapper who who was uh, shot dead in in. Uh, in Vegas, in front of like uh, 200 witnesses, none of whom saw a thing, uh, mysteriously enough. The, the oddest thing in that story was that Tupac Shakur uh, turned out to be living next door <laughs> to Wayne Newton. <laughs> and like, if you're just an ordinary person and you live next door to a gangster rapper, that's not the easiest kind of neighbor uh, to have. Uh, but for, if you're like Wayne Newton, the idea of Wayne, it sounds like some lousy, it sounds like the world's worst sitcom premise. <laughs> You've got a Vegas loud singer and a gangster rapper living next door to each other. You know, I don't know, I don't know, you, uh, you know, I don't know uh, what, the, what the deal is with that. As I said, it's like a, l- a lousy sitcom premise. It's like Florence Henderson and Justin Bieber living next door to each other or something. I don't know. Uh, but but uh, but it was just one of those details that that struck me, and that uh, and that rather poignant uh, song, uh, Dankashay. By the way, do you know who wrote the uh, the lyrics to Dankashay? Having a clue. I know it wasn't Billy, Wayne. Billy Crystal's uncle. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's. What, I'm just saying, if it comes up on Jeopardy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I think I think that's just one. Of, it's just one of those uh, songs that uh, it pops into my head at odd times, and it did with Evil Can Evil too. There's another interesting juxtaposition early on in the book between Ronald Reagan and England's James Callahan. Intentionally or not, for a guy who hates England so much that he returned Winston Churchill's bust, Barack Obama's model for rebooting America, particularly in his cyclonic first term seem to be transforming America into Britain in the 1970s. As you write in The Passing Parade, though, if you want to know what Reaganite affability boils down to without political will or philosophy, look at Callahan. Could you talk a bit about Jim Callahan and pre-Thatcher England in general and why we seem to be repeating that cycle in the America of the 21st century? Yeah, the the, the fun part of that book, in a way, is like putting... uh these various obituaries in in an order in which they tell a story. And uh, Reagan and Jim Callahan were both uh, two figures of roughly the same generation, uh, the the same political generation, and uh, famous for their affability. Um, Reagan was a transformative president. Callahan thought, who, who in some ways, if you just looked at his uh, curriculum vitae had the most impressive resume of any British politician of his generation. He'd held all the great, of, what they called the great offices of state in Britain. He'd been Home Secretary, he'd been Chancellor of the Exchequer, he'd been Foreign Secretary. And when he came, prime, he became Prime Minister. He he realized, as he said to a friend of mine, that his job was just to manage decline. Uh, and that actually is rather Obama-like in a way. You get you get the feeling that the thing. What what I find interesting about the Obama era is that the things that those on the right, uh, to put it in com- in in the computer cliche terms, the things that people on the right think are a bug, you get the feeling that with Obama they're a feature. You know, for so for example, when you complain that America seems irrelevant to world affairs. And America is retreating from the world, and we're we're heading into a post-American world. You feel that for Obama, <laughs> that's not a problem. That's everything going to plan. That he does. He basically uh, believes, in in some sense, he is committed to American geopolitical decline. Um, and and he reads books on that. He was famously photographed with uh, Fareed Zakaria's book. Uh, which posits that America is going to decline, but it doesn't really matter because places like China and India will be rising. Uh, and Jim Callahan, everybody in Britain in the 70s thought that decline was, in, was inevitable and that uh, the, what, uh, what uh, the job of government was to do was to manage decline. And that's Obama-like too. So, for example, uh, the, again, when the right complained that there are now 60 million uh, people on food stamps, uh, the left say, well, what's the big deal about that? That just shows how compassionate we are and how effective 
well-being at putting our compassion into action. So they're actively promoting food stamps because they think that while the 60 million people on food stamps is a good start, it'd actually be a lot better if there were 80 million or 120 million people on food stamps. Uh, and almost all the features, <laughs> I mean, which is the advantage we foreigners have over you native chappies, Ed, is that uh, you know, almost all the features of Obama's America we've seen before. This is the land where we uh, grew up, uh, rising brigadoon-like from the mists after all this time, where the government um, makes the, your automobiles, where the government runs the health care business. Uh, so, so that in, 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 in Britain, that was thought of as, in, by the mid-70s, that was thought of as an entirely normal feature of life, that the government should make your automobile. Uh, people, people can't really quite imagine what it was like. You had to wait months to get a telephone line. If you'd, you, you know now where everybody's walking around with cell phones, uh, and actually it's more difficult in America, but in London... Uh, you can get off the plane at Heathrow and walk into some uh, store and be using a new cell phone in like uh, 90 seconds. And nobody can believe that until the late 90s, until Mrs. Thatcher privatized uh, the GPO, as it, as it then was, that you had to wait months to get a telephone line put in your house. Uh, you had to wait months for a new car. They'd, 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 uh, they'd, they'd, they'd come up with these new makes of cars, and you had to put your name on a waiting list. It's, it's not just everyone knows about the waiting list for the hate replacement and all that, but it was waiting list for telephones, waiting list for cars, waiting for everything. And the whole thing eventually on, on Callahan's watch uh, came crashing down when uh, the public sector workers went on strike, and you had garbage piling up in the streets and the dead going unburied. Um, and he was famously at a G7 summit in the Caribbean and, uh, and uh, pictured tanning himself with, uh, with uh, uh, Carter and uh, uh, Helmut Schmidt and uh, Mitterrand and whoever the other guys were at that time. And, and he responded to the accusation that he wasn't taking it seriously with a, a sort of insouciant phrase that Rupert Murdoch's son turned into the headline, Crisis, what crisis? <laughs> and, uh, and at that point, uh, the whole, not just Mr. Callahan's ministry, but a whole 30-year assumption of state power came crashing down uh, and Mrs. Thatcher became prime minister, privatized the telephones, privatized the car industry, and, uh, and set about transforming Britain. Mark, in contrast to your obit for Argentina's general Leopoldo Galtieri, which follows shortly after Callahan's obituary, illustrates just how resolute Margaret Thatcher could be when challenged. And she did it all without hashtags. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yes, hashtag give, give back our islands. That, that would have been that would have been this administration's response to the Falklands War. Um, yeah, it, I mean, people forget the state the Western world was in by the end of the seventies. Uh, basically, uh, during the first Carter term, the West had spent uh, those four years ceding prime real estate all over the planet to uh, to the Soviet Union. Doesn't matter whether it was a long way away. Uh, as when the Soviets went into Afghanistan, or somewhat nearer to home, uh, when communists came to power in Grenada, uh, and and that was the that was the assumption that the West would grumble but would never do anything. And everyone thought when uh, when Leopoldo Gal Leopoldo Galtieri thought, as everyone else did, that when he invaded the Falkland Islands. Uh, that the British would moan and whine, uh, but that in the end, uh, some UN mediator would be appointed and there'd be some blue helmeted peacekeepers who would uh, be uh, flown in to stand around. Uh, but that in the end, nothing would change and Argentina would get sovereignty over those islands. And the idea that, that the toothless British lion uh, would dispatch a task force all the way to the South Atlantic and kick those guys uh, off uh, the islands and sink all, and sink you know virtually the entire Argentine navy and in the end uh, do such a great job that Galtieri fell from power and Argentina and most of Latin America became democratic societies. It was a small nothing war, uh, but it uh, but it signaled 
uh, that it was a new era and it marked the pushback uh, after the Carter-Callahan years. It marked the pushback uh, at which the Soviets and everybody else learned that, no, the West was not simply going to uh, sort of uh, take, a, uh, take a sleeping pill into oblivion, but could actually be roused to defend itself and to push back hard. Beyond the political figures covered in the passing parade, I loved your obit for Bob Hope, if only because my dad worshipped Bing Crosby. And so Hope and Crosby were regular features on TV and on record in our house growing up. I don't think people realize how Bob Hope basically invented the modern form of the stand-up comic. But how did he lose so much cultural cachet starting in the late 1960s? Yes, because it's a funny thing. I actually, and even even kind of good friends of mine. Um, I remember once being on a show um, with uh, with uh, Jonah Goldberg and Rob Long uh, over at Ricochet, and uh, and and Jonah was sort of made a passing reference to Bob Hope as the epitome of the kind of old school comic where you just do, where funnier is faster, uh, and you just do it louder and more vulgar, and that uh, and and he didn't understand that for the young comics, no, it's about slowing down. In fact, you know, when Bob Hope was starting in the 1920s, um, I've, got a, I've got a little thing in there about how he, at one point they put him in an act with Violet and Daisy Hilton, who were these uh, Siamese uh, twins who did sort of three-legged tap dancing. Um, Bob, Bob Hope said, uh, <laughs> they're way too much woman for me, was his comment on them. Uh, and, uh, and that was... That was the world he started in, where it was all, there were like ethnic comics, the so-called Dutch comics, they used to call them, uh, they, uh, who would do jokes in funny accents and would be wearing funny clothes, would be wearing big shoes, uh, would be doing essentially vaudeville routines. And Hope was the first guy, in effect, uh, to do what, say, John Stewart does. He actually he did it, he... he in a way, John Stewart's gone back to the vaudeville because he does the mugging and the double takes and the exaggerated facial tics and all the rest of it. But he, Hope was the first guy to do what the topical late night comics do, which is just to stroll on stage and make jokes about uh, people who are in the news, about uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, about uh, FDR. Uh, he was the first guy to do that, and he did it at a time, as I said, at a time when everybody thought the big bucks was in a certain kind of uh, vaudevillian cross-talk acts or loud, uh, funny physical comedy. And he was, and he was the guy who just said, "No, I'll just wear a tuxedo, I'll walk out on stage, and I'll tell jokes about what's in the news." And he, and 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 he established, in that sense, what we regard as stand-up comedy today. Nobody gives him any credit of that. Uh, because, of course, he found himself on the wrong side of the culture wars after Vietnam, and he never quite figured out a way to get, to, to get back uh, to having a foot in both camps. I mean, he was hugely popular. I quote something like a poll around 1968, 1969, where he was American high school seniors' favorite comedian. Uh, like uh, Bob Hope, 1969, where we think, you know, summer of love, Vietnam, uh, the, 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 there's a change are coming. Uh, you say you want a revolution. And in fact, all the young people love Bob Hope. And, and somewhere in the next three to four years, uh, he, he, the guy with a foot in both camps somehow managed to lose uh, that one side, never got it back. And that's why all these people like John Stewart, David Letterman, all the rest of them who are basically working in the field he invented uh, regard him as this kind of... Uh, obsolete figure from another era, but he invented what they do. Inadvertently, Bob Hope also played a role in your departure from National Review last December, when you resurrected his joke from the mid-1970s in an effort at pushing back against the attempt at getting the Duck Dynasty crew blacklisted from TV. You quoted Hope joking that, quote, I've just flown in from California where they've made homosexuality legal. I thought I'd get out before they made it compulsory. Right. You were a fixture in National Review for years in the magazine, the website, and on the cruises, where I've witnessed firsthand your many groupies on the cruise. Could you talk right. about? I, your... well, I, enjoy, I always enjoyed those uh, those cruises actually because it's 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 the nearest that uh, 
you know, uh, sad, obscure right-wing hacks get to feel like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk about your parting of the ways with National Review? Yeah, I was... Uh, I, I've, I, National Review and I are, are being sued by Michael Mann, who's the guy who came up with the, uh, the, the climate change hockey stick, the global warming hockey stick that shows uh, the last millennium as the flat shaft of the hockey stick, you know, no change. And then the 20th century is this blade shooting up uh, and going, disappearing out the top right-hand corner of the graph and basically saying, we're all going to fry. And the promotion of that graph by, in, by the uh, IPCC uh, in 2001 basically got the whole global warming alarmism industry, took it to a new level, and uh, and made Michael Mann a global star. But I regard that hockey stick as absolute rubbish as science, uh, and I said so on National Review. And um, so we found ourselves being sued. Uh, and at a certain point, um, I felt we were, as the as the lawyers like to say in, uh, in, in Commonwealth countries, I don't think they use the phrase here, but we were, although we were co-defendants, we were differently situated. Um, and I, I, I felt, I, I felt National Review had not been as gung ho about the case as, um, as McLean's magazine had when, when I had my free speech issues up in Canada. McLean's is not in any sense ideologically right wing. Uh, but it, 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 it was an absolutely uh, powerful, fierce defender of free speech uh, by my side when uh, the Canadian Islamic Congress decided to come after us. So, so I was happy to be in a foxhole with McLean's. I was kind of not so happy to be in a foxhole with National Review. Um, not so much... Uh, people... People ought to be wary. You, you, you know, people people ought to misunderstand what I'm saying here. Um, my editor uh, did a a piece at National Review attacking my use of that Bob Hope joke, and uh, and another Dean Martin joke that I think are from the same vintage that I quoted. I'd quoted what would now be regarded as two homophobic jokes, but which I thought were oddly prescient in the Duck Dynasty days. Uh, and I don't want to be told what not to say. And so this, there was something slightly off to me about uh, what my editor said uh, about how he found those, uh, uh, that Bob Hope joke offensive. I don't know why. I, I think it's rather droll. And by the way, if that's offensive, by the, by the way, we, we live in a world where, you know, the North Koreans have just compared Obama to a, a monkey. Uh, and where the Sudanese government has uh, just uh, sentenced a woman to death uh, because she made the mistake of converting from Islam to Christianity, and uh, and made uh, and and where in uh, Nigeria a bunch of girls have just been kidnapped and sold into sex slavery. Now this is the real. These are this. this that's the real racism. That's the real war on religion. That's the real war on women. And we here in the, in the decadent First World West obsess about bogus offenses like a 1963 Dean Martin joke. And so when a, a so-called conservative editor tells you that you can't say, use a 1963 Dean Martin joke or a 1975 Bob Hope joke, he's telling you uh, that, that he's, he's bought into the left's view of life, uh, that speech has to be circumscribed, that we all have to self-censor lest we commit appalling hate crimes like the first grade class in uh, Fargo uh, that wanted, uh, that's in the news the uh, last couple of days, that, that made the mistake of picking YMCA to do at the school talent show uh, until a woman helpfully pointed out that it would be utterly racist uh, for one of them to dress up as the Indian member of the village people. And so, and so these, these first grade kids uh, were turned into the Donald Sterling Tabernacle Choir and told they can't take part in the thing. And there's a, a conservative. It's nothing to do with the First Amendment. It's nothing to do with what government says you can say. It's nothing to do with political speech. When conservatives assist in the narrowing of the, uh, of, 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 of the bounds of public discourse like that, 
um, they're not. That's not. Uh, that's not a comfortable position for me to be mixed up in. Um, and I felt that edit. I felt that editor was wrong on that. Not so much because I'm particularly invested in my Bob Hope joke or my Dean Martin joke, but because at the time he said that we were in D.C. Superior Court arguing for the right to say what we said about Michael Mann, and at the same time. There's, uh, there's our editor going out and saying, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't say this stuff and all the rest of it. So I, I have no problem. There's many people. I think Jay Nordlinger is one of my favorite writers. I have an awful lot of respect for Kevin Williams. And there's all kinds of people at National Review that, that I admire enormously. But I, 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 think, uh, I think to a certain extent they have imbibed too much of the sort of shriveling of cultural space uh, that has gone on in the last uh, in the last couple of years. Mark, you mentioned your trial with Michael Mann. Where does it stand, and what happens next? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, you, you know, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a foreigner, and, and foreigners only uh, know two things about the American justice system: that if you ever make the mistake of getting mixed up in up in it. Um, that it costs you a fortune and it consumes years of your life. And that's what, like, this, whatever there are, 7 billion people on the planet, and that's what the 6.7 billion who aren't American all think about the American justice system. And, and living here for many years, I'd sort of assume there must be more to it than that. <laughs> and, and then I discovered in D.C. Superior Court uh, that, in fact, it isn't, that... that, that that it is going to go on for years, uh, and it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to cost a significant seven-figure sum, even if you win. And um, a, a, and so what? Uh, so so again, my posture on the case changed from National Review somewhat. Um, I National Review wanted to appeal the anti-slap motion. When the anti-slap motion was denied by an incompetent judge. I basically said, you know, there's no. We might as well just get into court, get this guy on the witness stand, and have at it, and leave it to twelve American jurors to vote this thing up or down. And I was, I, I'm, all, I'm, I'm about that. I'm, I'm moving. I'm interested in deposition and discovery and getting into trial. I'm not interested in any more of the procedural stuff. Um, National Review has taken a slightly different posture, and they're appealing uh, the denial of the motion to dismiss the amended complaint under the anti-slap statute. So if you're following that, you understand there was a complaint, then the complaint was amended, then there was a motion to dismiss the complaint, then the motion to dismiss the complaint was denied, and now there's an appeal uh, to uh, against the denial of the motion to dismiss the amended complaint. Except it's not, because it turns out the law was written in such a, a, a vague way that it's not clear whether there's any right to appeal under this law. So before they can appeal the dismissal, the de appeal the denial of the motion to dismiss the amended complaint, they first have to appeal to the Court of Appeals uh, to see whether the Court of Appeals will rule on whether this particular law is appealable. And if the Court of Appeals rules that this particular law is appealable, then they will apply to them to hear... Uh, they, they, they will appeal to the Court of Appeals then to hear the actual appeal after the Court of Appeals has ruled on whether the appeal is in fact appealable. So, you know, uh, 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 that sound your listeners can, can hear in the background is me just taking a chainsaw to my brain. Because <laughs> this, is, this is the world I'm living in. Somewhere you know? Franz Kafka is hearing all this and saying, well, that's too much for me, boys. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, and so, and so I, I, I've countersued Michael Mann because I think, you know, I didn't ask for this fight, but if he wants this fight, I think the I, I think the, the the sort of the way the uh, the ayatollahs of alarmism uh, have have waged this climate war um, I think has been quite disgraceful and appalling for freedom of speech and I've been quite horrified by the tales that you know cli young climate scientists say about the uh, the so-called climate of fear uh, that these alarmist guys have introduced to uh, this previously obscure branch of science. And so I would like to, I've countersued him in a way because I, I, I want to, apart from anything else, uh, I figure I've got this much time invested in the thing. In the end, in the end, 
uh, this isn't going to be one of these lousy things where it just drifts on and, uh, and, uh, and gets ineffectually settled a decade and a half down the road, which by which time I hope global warming will have kicked in because I would rather the planet fried uh, than, uh, than, than, than let this thing uh, drag on uh, for, 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 for another decade. But I, I do, you know, I, I am determined now. To, he, want, he, he took me on, and if he wants to be in court and if he wants to be on the witness stand being cross-examined under oath about all this stuff, then fine, let's do it in court. And, uh, and so I wish, I, you know, I wish National Review the best of luck with the appeal on whether the appeal is appealable. Uh, but, but in the end, I, I want to get him in court and I want to get him on the stand. And Mark, last question. There are a lot of people in the passing parade that I wish we had had time to talk about. But as I mentioned at the start of the interview, I think the passing parade will be remembered as a brilliant snapshot of pop culture and politics at the dawn of the 21st century. That period seems remarkably vibrant compared with today's enervated culture, at least in America. So how will history remember culture in the Obama years? Well, I, I'm not sure it's fair to blame it all on Obama. I think there's a sense of sort of uh, of just circling back on yourself, on feeding, you, you, you know, like a like a dog that winds up chewing on its own leg. Um, I'm very conscious, you know. I've got, I've got three young kids, and, and my daughter is at is at high school now, and I'm very conscious, you know, that I she has eclectic tastes in music and. Uh, and all the rest of it. I'm very conscious when you when you um, when you're when you're around her crowd. Uh, I, I mean, I said to her the other day. She she was talking about the Sex Pistols. I said, oh, I saw the Sex Pistols. <laughs> she was like staggered. She said, What do you mean? You're <laughs> you're Mr. Squaresville. Uh, you uh, you like Frank Sinatra. You like Bing Crosby. Well, what do you do? They're the Sex Pistols. Gig. I said, well, that's how old they are. I said, you liking you and your friends finding the Sex Pistols cool, uh, and and your and your guys dressing up as they were, like uh, Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious. That's like me and my pals, you know, uh, at the, at the time of the Sex Pistols. That's like me and my pals going around dressed up like the Andrews Sisters. You know, there is there is a at a, a there. The, there's, there, uh, I, I think, I think mass culture, for some, mass culture has, has sort of abandoned, has died, and we now have sort of mutually hostile, opposing camps of sort of unpopular, popular cultures. Uh, so you don't have, you know, whoever takes over the the late night shows. You know, Stephen Colbert taking over from David. Lay. I mean, Stephen Colbert is not going to be uh, what Johnny Carson or Jack Parr. Uh, or Steve Allen were on the Tonight Show. He simply he can't he uh, he can't be. Though the the, the mass culture uh, has become has become competing bits of minority culture. You can have a big, I mean, you can have a big hit in America now. Uh, we with with four million people, which basically means that whatever it is, three hundred and fifteen million Americans don't have to be involved in it, and that's very different from the way mid century. Uh, mid 20th century American American pop culture was, and there were disadvantages to that in a sense. Um, but it also means there's a sort of uh, there's not enough cultural glue that that things don't become big enough so that they become sort of embedded in the in the time uh, and come to encapture that encapsulate that time. And I think that I think that's one of the big I think that's one of the big differences now. We have customized pop culture. People can basically design their own pop cultural universe, um, uh, which is great uh, at a certain level. But at another level, it means that there isn't the same sound of an ear. You know, the sound of America in 1939 is the Glenn Miller band playing Moonlight Serenade. Uh, you know, the sound of America in 1924 is the Isham Jones Orchestra playing It Had to Be You. The sound of America in 1911 is Alexander's Ragtime Band. The sound of America in 1893 is After the Ball. There's nothing, it's not, it's that, that kind of mass culture uh, has gone. And we're back to, uh, apart from anything else in copyright terms, uh, something closer to a sort of mid-19th century model of, uh, of pop culture, I would say. 
This is Ed Driscoll, and we've been speaking with the great Mark Stein of SteinOnline.com and The Rush Limbaugh Show on the latest edition of his book, Mark Stein's Passing Parade. It's available from Amazon.com, SteinOnline.com, and your local bookstore. And Mark, continued success fighting the good fight, and thank you once again for stopping by PJMedia.com today. My my pleasure, Ed. And I'll, uh, I promise to come back in uh, six or seven years' time and give you an update on how my lawsuit's going. <laughs>